uh, Dr. Matt Kasson, sorry, I'm saying it wrong, Matt, I'm sure. But no, it's is right. it Kasson? Kasson. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Kasson is an associate professor of mycology and forest pathology at West Virginia University. His lab's research focuses on fungal diseases of trees and woody plants, fungus arthropod interactions, and fungal biological control of invasive plants, pests, and pathogens. He also teaches courses in general plant pathology, general microbiology, and forest pest management. So that's a lot, but over to Matt now to dazzle us with zombie cicadas. Over to you, Matt. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be here to be presenting uh, to you from across the pond. Um, and um, I'm really excited to be talking about work that I've been involved with uh, since uh, 2016. So the last eight years or so, not quite the lifespan of even a 13-year cicada, let alone a 17-year cicada. Uh, but I hope um, uh, during those eight years, I've learned enough to offer you some insights into cracking the code on this enigmatic mutualism. Um, so I want to first uh, acknowledge my student, Molly Sherlock, who drew this beautiful uh, illustration of a zombie cicada. Uh, this is a uh, periodical cicada infected with Mesospora cicadina, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that as we go forward. Before I can really get into the whole zombie cicada thing, I, I have to give you some background on cicadas, assuming that some of you are well-versed in, in insect biology and insect diversity and others not. Cicadas belong to the superfamily uh, um, uh, in, in order in the order Hemiptera, uh, they're hemimetabolists, which means they have incomplete metamorphosis. So, as uh, juveniles, they have a nymph stage, as seen here in the upper right, um, which looks far different from their adult stage, seen here, here, and here. Um, they feed on sap via piercing, sucking mouth parts, as do most Hemiptera, and um, mostly we can find them in the tropical regions of the world. These are, are close relatives of plant and leaf hoppers, but of course they're a little bit bigger um, and in some cases a lot bigger. So there's two families of cicadas. There's the today, which are the hairy cicadas. And those are really um, very limited uh, in, in species and, and range. There's only two species that are extant. And then there's the cicadae which uh, includes some 3,200 species. These are the true cicadas and will be the focus of, of today's talk. Um, I also want to kind of clarify that there's annual and there's periodical cicadas, but just because they're annual doesn't mean they only take one year to develop. Annual cicadas typically take two to five years to develop underground as nymphs before emerging and spend several weeks above ground mating and then dying. Uh, that contrasts with periodical cicadas, which spend 13 or 17 years underground as nymphs and then come up for several weeks to mate um, and uh, reproduce, lay eggs, and die. Uh, and, and there are seven species of magic cicada, um, that is the periodical cicadas, and 15 extant broods. Um, and I'll explain what a brood is here in a second, uh, but there's basically four 17-year cicada species and three 13 year cicada species. So what is a brood? Well, these are populations, discrete geographic populations of 13 or 17 year periodical cicadas that emerge in a given area at a given time. Now I can't see all my um, slide because of the, the video, but you can see here on the upper right, um, a map of all the different broods um, juxtaposed next to each other, some overlapping on the map. And most of the 13-year cicadas occur in the deep south, eastern United States, whereas the 17-year cicadas occur further north um, and extending as far north as Wisconsin and into New England uh, for some of those 17-year broods. Um, there's also an expansion or there has been an expansion and contraction of broods over time with some extinctions. For example, um, those of you that are good with, uh, you know, the counting numbers would, would recognize that you don't see 11 and 12 on that list. Um, they probably did occur at some point, uh, but they've since gone extinct. Also, uh, brood um, seven in California, or sorry, in Pennsylvania uh, and New York um, is very limited in range. Um, and it's uh, posited that they could go extinct within the next few generations. 
Uh, something we'll talk about again and again is kind of the evolutionary history of the cicadas themselves. So each cicada group has a 13 and a 17 year counterpart. With in terms of the decim group, there's there's actually two 13 year uh, cicadas and one 17 year. But you could see this is the evolutionary history of those cicadas where um, uh, decim uh, diverged from the Cassini and Decula group about 3.9 million years ago, and Cassini and Decula diverged from each other about 2.5 million years ago. And there's a great review published by Chris Simon and colleagues in 2022, if you want to read more about that. I don't have time to get into too many more of the details. Um, a, a little connection here is that um, it was Linnaeus himself that described Cicada Septendecim, now known as Magis Cicada Septendecim. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Swedish naturalist Kahn, who traveled um, to Pennsylvania and New York in 1749. Uh, fortunately, he was able to br uh, observe um, Brood X emergence uh, in 1749 along the banks of the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. And he published that account in 1756 um, under the title that I won't try to uh, butcher, uh, but basically it's a description of, a, uh, uh, of an interesting locust. And grasshopper is, is, is actually the, uh, the Swedish word for locust uh, in North America. But, but Kahn's account was really the basis for the first scientific description and classification of the periodical cicada in 1758 by Linnaeus. And, in, and of course, you're all familiar with, uh, you know, these various editions of, of this iconic work. Um, and this is currently Magicata Sepindecim. Um, so, you know, it was described uh, from an emergence in 1749. Uh, I witnessed Brood X emergence in Virginia in 2021. So 16 generations later, I'm studying uh, a zombifying fungus on the same brood uh, that was used and set the basis for the description of the species. A little bit more background on cicadas that's useful is, is they have uh, piercing mouth parts for drinking sap. I've already mentioned that. Um, it's posited that they actually drink um, um, and, and are able to count sap cycles by detecting changes in, in flow and, and nutrient content. Um, they also have conspicuous courtship calls by male cicadas, um, and they do so through a specialized structure called a timble. Uh, females respond to these calls by wing flicks to basically say they're receptive to mating. So the males have to be visually close to the female to watch for these coordinated wing flicks. Um, a lot of work has been done looking at the obligate bacterial partners of cicadas. Cicadas feed on sap, and sap is pretty nutrient poor. So some of the amino acids they need are provided by their bacterial endosymbiotic partners. And these are housed in specialized organs called a bacteriome. Um, and like I said, there's been a lot of great work done on that. Um, in recent years, it's been recognized that some of these cicadas um, no longer have those uh, bacterial partners, but they've been supplanted uh, by a domesticated version of Ophiocordyceps. This was a paper published by uh, Yu Matsura and colleagues uh, in 2018, showing that in fact, um, these specialized cells that, that typically would harbor bacteria now harbor a consortia of fungi and one of the two bacterial partners that were originally there. So where are cicadas? Well, if you're familiar with iNaturalist, which is a great community science platform, you would know that cicadas are everywhere. Um, in fact, on iNaturalist alone, there's some 341,000 plus observations spanning 1,407 species. If you live in Great Britain, um, there's a lot of great things, I'm sure. One of the not so great things is the lack of cicadas. In fact, um, I'm just probing uh, iNaturalist this week, there's four observations um, covering two species, which may actually be three species, but here's the pictures. Uh, this includes the genus Cicada, uh, Dorsiana, and, and Tybacina. And you can see where those observations are here, um, two of them being around uh, the greater London area. But Great Britain at least had a native cicada, the New Forest Cicada. Um, in 2015, there was an article in the BBC, the search for Britain's only native cicada um, uh, is on. And unfortunately, they did not find it. Uh, but you can see based on these 
uh, contemporary observations that it is present in, in various countries in, in Europe, um, but has not been seen in at least 24 years in Great Britain. Um, Mesospora, which is the, uh, the star of the show today, is a uh, genus uh, of, of fungus that was established by Peck uh, with a description of Mesospora cicadina from, from Magis cicadus ependesim in New York um, in 1877. So I explained the different broods. This was brood two. And it was the same species, Magis cicadus ependesim, that Linnaeus himself described. So um, there's seven species of Magis cicada, but Magis cicada sependesim served as the model um, and the type for you know, the description of cicada, but also as the first host to Mesospora cicadina. This is a, a member of the Entomopterales, which is a Zopagomycota. Um, most of us are familiar with the Dicaria, that is Ascomycota, Basidiomycota. Uh, Zopagomycota is one of the earliest diverging um, lineages of non-flagellate fungi. All, all fungal phyla that precede it are, are swimming um, flagellate fungi that have swimming spores. Um, Mesospora includes some 13 obligate sexually transmissible species, infecting 21 cicada species worldwide that we know of. Um, here are some examples of those Mesospora infections on their respective hosts, including Cicadina, Levospora, Platypedia, Dysroprocta, and Tetagades from Chile. Uh, the rest of these are all from the United States. Uh, but really, you know, although it was published or described in 1879 by Peck, it wasn't really until 1974 when Richard Soper came along and did a big monograph on Mesospora that we got any bit of uh, momentum on studying this enigmatic fungus. So it was really a mycological oddity for, for 100 years. Um, here's kind of a table summarizing the different Mesospora species that were established by Soper and others. You can see not only that there's um, not too many of them, but a dozen. You can look over here on the right and kind of see where they occur. Brazil, Australia, uh, Florida, Brazil, Mexico, Canada. So a lot of them in the um, Western Hemisphere, particularly um, North and Central and South America. Mesospora's uh, hosts um, span the the basically diversity of cicadas this is a cladogram that i put together it's it's truncated meaning i've i've pruned out the the cicada genera that are not known to be susceptible uh but i've ranged them um according to phylogenies uh, that were um constructed for all true cicadas and you can kind of see those um you know those all, all the cicadas in this cladogram are susceptible to mesospora but those with red dots represent ones we actually physically have specimens for or have sampled and we'll talk about um, during today's talk. So what's really interesting about Mesospora is even though it was described in, in 1879 formally, we really only generated the first DNA sequence data in my lab in 2016. Um, and in and, and doing so, we confirmed uh, four species. We showed that Mesospora levispora on Okanagana and Mesospora platypedia on platypedia cicadas were actually one genealogically exclusive um, lineage, uh, meaning that we synonymized them as one species. Uh, even though they occur on two different hosts separated by geography, it is in fact one species, not two. Um, what seemed pretty interesting is there, there seemed to be some congruence between the fungus and the host phylogenies. Um, and we'll explore this a little more in that Mesospora tetagades from Chile um, and tetagades, a cicada host, are both among the earliest diverging clades um, in their respective organisms, um, so or in their respective families. Um, al although we were able to generate successfully uh, 28S uh, elongation factor and beta tubulin sequences, we couldn't generate ITS sequences despite uh, exhaustive efforts. Um, with two exceptions, we were able to generate a partial sequence for one Mesospora cicadina and one Mesospora um, dyseroprocta. Um, but when we blasted those, they didn't come back as anything. So did we actually have ITS sequences? It was unclear. 
uh, this is a little bit of foreshadowing and I'll get into why that is important here in a second and what we learned this year. Uh, but this is really setting the stage for some of the discoveries that came about even in the last three months. The only way to link our work with the historic studies, of course, is through morphology. And as, as a mycologist, um, we're used to doing this. We're used to measuring spores. And if you work with culturable fungi, um, you could look at uh, growth rates and, and different things. Um, but we're dealing with an obligate, uh, uh, ob obligate biotroph um, that cannot be cultured. As such, we can only kind of examine the spores and the fungus that occurs on these specimens. So we're able to show that like things like mean canadial widths differ among species. And you can see that here in the middle panel, whereas Mesospora cicadina, Dysroprocta, Levospora, Platypedia, and Tetagades um, were all different. Now, remember, I, I said that Mesospora Levospora and Mesospora Platypedia were basically one species. Yet when we look at the spores, they're actually different. Um, and the body size of these cicadas are different too. So that really conflicts with the molecular data. But generally, the cicadas will produce um, two different spore types. They'll first develop a canidial plug that looks like a chalky uh, white plug emerging from their rear ends. Um, and this is the uh, sexually transmissible stage. Um, these are canidia asexual spores. And then those that come in contact with infected individuals will then develop a resting spore stage. And these look um, chunky and durable because they're meant to survive in the soil. But for how long, 13, 17 years? That's really a big question mark um, that we're still hoping to answer. <clears throat> What's really exciting and interesting to the press about cicadas and, and the zombifying fungus uh, that infects them is this behavioral modification. Um, and, and it causes something called active host transmission. Uh, my former postdoc, Brian Lovett in the lab and I uh, and, and others posted um, published a, a little piece in, in PLOS Pathogens back in 2020, where we kind of uh, juxtapose these different kind of um, infection strategies. And active host transmission, like we see in Mesospora, if we follow this uh, you know, subway map, we have, does, it, does the host behavior facilitate transmission? Yes. Are the spores discharged by the fungus? No, um, they're not actively discharged. They just kind of fall out like uh, flying salt shakers of death. Uh, and what's the host status during transmission? It's alive. So a lot of what we know about behavior modification comes from the zombie ant system and ophiocordyceps, where the fungus coerces the host to climb to an elevated location, affix to a substrate, die, and then the fungus erupts post-mortem, and then spores rain down onto unsuspecting ants below or other hosts below. Uh, with the case of active host transmission, these cicadas are kept alive, even though a third of their body has been uh, replaced by fungus. They no longer have genitalia. They can no longer truly mate. Um, they still continue to engage in those behaviors. And this is, too, a trick of the fungus uh, to maximize spore dispersal during a window of time, you know, five, six weeks. You know, this fungus has waited 16 years to 17 years to spread around. Um, they want to make sure it gets around. So active host transmission seems to be the behavior modification that works for cicadas. In addition to this active host transmission, which isn't unique to Mesospora, it's seen in strong Wellesley as well, you get this hypersexual behavior where males, for example, uh, that will uh, pretend to be females in order to get healthy males to come and attempt to mate. This in turn doubles the amount of cicadas that an infected individual can come in contact with. <clears throat> And sometimes you're left with a gruesome picture that's shown here on the lower left. What you're seeing there um, is actually uh, an infected male with a broken off uh, genitalia of the female still attached. Why is that? Well, the female was infected when she uh, mated with the male. And when the male went to um, leave after they were finished mating, um, the muscle tissue and the exoskeleton itself were compromised. Um, so they couldn't separate. And he broke off her abdomen and genitalia and flew away with it. We often find males um, like this in the field with the uh, genitalia and uh, ovipositor 
and you know posterior abdomen of the female um, still attached. So quite gruesome, uh, but um, that, so is the fungus. One of the more interesting early discoveries that maybe put Mesospora on uh, the modern day radars was uh, we were attempting to understand, you know, things that could explain some of these behavioral modifications. And we did basically global metabolomics on these fungal plugs. And when we did, we found that Mesospora cicadina plugs contained um, cathinone, which is a, a naturally occurring amphetamine um, that we know from cat plant. And, and um, those of you that... Um, are familiar with um, or from the Middle East uh, might know that in places like Yemen um, and other parts of the Middle East, um, cat plant is chewed as a stimulant um, and it's used um, uh, in, 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 uh, largely in, in male groups where they have conversations and, and, um, and, and use cat as a stimulant uh, and it helps to engage conversation. Um, cat is not legal in the United States, uh, nor is a lot of things except firearms, unfortunately, uh, but we won't go there. Uh, but anyways, uh, Mesospora cicadina is known to produce this cathinone. And we see that here in this, um, this fold change picture. We also were able to compare the fingerprint of that cathinone to a DEA exempt standard. Um, you know, it's one thing to detect something using mass spectrometry. It's quite another um, to actually compare it on the same instrument against an analytical standard to see if it fragments the same way. So we did confirm that and in fact validate that it was there. Um, we also found psilocybin, a psychoactive tryptamine in Mesospora levispora. Um, and that was really interesting. Um, although today's talk will be focused mostly on Mesospora cicadina. And the fragmentations of both patterns matched uh, their known standards. But would we find genetic evidence for alkaloid biosynthesis? Um, um, we, we tried to generate an Illumina uh, sequence um, for Mesospora cicadina, and it was highly fragmented. We cannot culture this fungus, so really we're trying to, to you know, generate a metagenome. But the estimated genome size was really big for a fungus, around 776 million base pairs. But the Busco scores, which you know, tell us something about the completeness of the genome, was extremely low, like uh, just not really good at all. Um, that said, we did find uh, multiple genes for all classes of enzymes in the biosynthetic pathway, um, as seen here on the right. Uh, but the first step, the phenylalanine ammonia lyase step, was missing in the genome. And there was some evidence of coordinated regulation, but let's just say um, for, for you know, saving time that we just had really bad starting genome. Um, this inspired us to really um, generate a, a, a a better genome. And in recent years, we published this in, in, in microbial resource announcements. We generated a 1.489 gigabase draft genome using a, a, a hybrid approach of, of short read and long read sequences um, for uh, brood eight cicadas. And this is the largest fungal genome currently known. Um, and it compares well with other entomopterales as well as rusts. Busco scores are still pretty low, 71% complete, but, but beats 48%. Uh, really interesting, only 7,500 predicted gene models. Now, its closest relative has some 28,000. So if this is, in fact, the largest fungal genome to date, it has some of the fewest genes um, of, of any fungus, <clears throat> excuse me, which is really, you know, um, a um, an interesting observation. Um, when you look at uh, G, uh at the genome itself, you see that it's mostly transposable elements, about 92% transposable elements. And that holds true across the entomopterales. Here's Mesospora cicadina here, here's Entomophthora musci, and some other uh, closely related uh, fungi. By having old and new genome, we were able to kind of look for evidence of cathinone biosynthesis. But sure enough, we're still missing that first step. Um, we were also able to look at, at some of the bacterial partners and some of the, we got some bacterial mags, uh, metagenome uh, assembled genomes of bacteria that came out of those plugs. And sure enough, they also have some of the, um, some of the uh, genes and, and enzymes needed for the production of that. But really the ultimate way to test that would be to look at um, uh, transcriptomics and, and that is something we're moving towards. But there's a lot of barriers. 
this is an unculturable fungus um, from field collected cicadas. The host you can't lab rear. I mean, could you imagine trying to get a PhD off something that takes 13 years to rear in the lab? It's just not possible. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of barriers. There's also an incomplete understanding of the disease cycle. This was a diagram um, that Dr. Lovett and I put together for our PLOS pathogens paper, um, showing kind of um, the uh, circuitous route of Mesospora cicadina. And and you don't have to understand or decipher much here, is but you'll see that in a number of places there's question marks, because we still don't know to this day whether or not um, the the nymphs themselves are infected on the way down or the way up. Um, uh, right now, the only evidence we have says that they are infected on the way up. Um, but given the recent evidence of domestication of ophiocordyceps um, and, and supplantation of bacterial partners in, in their abdomens, um, it's possible that that fungus is actually colonizing the cicadas in the nymph stage and either being neutral or beneficial during one stage and then parasitic during the other stage. But that is a, a, a lot of speculation um, with some um, limited evidence uh, and we're still investigating that. But at the end of the day, we still don't have any ITS sequence data. So we can't really understand if it's in the soil or, or where it is because we can't look at these kind of environmental you know, DNA sequencing projects because there's no ITS sequences for Mesospora. Um, and that kind of sets the stage for where this is going. Um, of course, there's not a lot of contemporary samples outside of the United States. Um, you know, with, with periodical cicadas, they come out uh, and there's billions and billions of them. But these other cicadas are not so easy to find um, unless we look in herbariums um, where there's specimens. Fortunately for us, we have a good working relationship with one of the herbariums that has most of the type specimens at Cornell called CUP. Um, and uh, we were able to sample a number of those herbarium specimens uh, for kind of a short read sequencing using Illumina. We also have a lot of contemporary 21st century specimens, uh, including Levispora, Mesospora tetagodes, and Dysroprocta, and we generated some genomes from those. But you probably are not too surprised that, you know, when, when everything came back, you know, these are, again, fungal plugs on the backs of cicadas. They can uh, be overtaken by other fungi, bacteria. If they're not dried properly. Really, we're only able to get a adequately assembled metagenome from Mesospora spinosa um, from Venezuela from 1967. And the genome assembly was about 25% that of the, the Mesospora cicadina genome. Um, we're able to also generate some, some morphology data because, again, the only way to link to the past is, is through those morphological studies although we've kind of shown that some of those approaches are invalid given uh, that there's overlapping morphology or, or different morphology between hosts, even when it's the same fungus. So not only did we have this ITS length polymorphism, um, but after looking at the priming sites for the standard ITS primers used for kingdom fungi, we also saw that there were some single nucleotide polymorphisms as we can see here in the ITS4 uh, region here, um, and uh, indicated in red, and the 5.S region indicated in purple. Um, so knowledge of the length combined with uh, an enhanced primer set um, allowed us to move forward with uh, attempting to sequence ITS regions across the genus. So how can broods 13 and 19 help us crack the code then? Well, we sought to sample infected specimens from all four of the 17-year Magisicata species from brood 13 and three of the 13-year Magisicata species from brood 19. Here in the map, here on the lower right, you could just see all the incidents of Magisicata observations um, in iNaturalist for 2024. And that represents all seven species. Now, the 13-year cicadas tend to be more southern states, and the 13-year, 17-year cicadas tend to be more northern states. Uh, but by having this dual emergence, it allowed us to sample across all seven species and find infected individuals of those seven species. So the plan was to generate ITS sequences for all these 2024 collected um, samples and archive specimens that we had 
sitting in the freezer. And that way we can test whether or not these two clades we had seen in the 28S data set are well supported, or if um, other patterns might emerge with the addition of, of taxa as well as the addition of new loci. This might also help clarify the fungus life cycle. If we know how to detect ITS, we could then look for it in the soil using specific probes. Um, and also one motivation of this collection was seen in the picture here is to collect fungal plugs and RNA later to allow for RNA sequencing um, and transcriptomics work to really fill in the gaps of the genome. Um, the genome data told us that we had the largest genome yet the smallest gene count. And really to confirm that, we need to look at basically uh, what genes are expressed um, during the conidial stage of the mesospora infection. And that's what these plugs are hoping to solve. What have we learned? Well, we worked with iNaturalist users to secure about 150 specimens from just brood 19 alone. We collected Magiscada tridecula uh, infected cicadas from Missouri, Tredicacini from Tennessee and Alabama, Tridecim from North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee and Alabama. We also traveled um, ourselves to Chicago. This was for the RNA sequencing project because those samples have to be collected in a very specific way. And we didn't want to have contamination and we wanted to ensure the best specimens possible. But it also allowed us to get additional um, infected Magicicada cassinis and Magicicada septodecims. Um, we did additional DNA extractions um, and morphology work on some of the archive specimens because some of our original collections were from 2016. That's eight years ago. Those DNA extracts um, uh, aren't really holding up. So we went back to the original specimens and re-extracted DNA. And here we can see some of the specimens we received, as well as the, the resting spores of one of the individuals that we collected. So. What the data showed is that, that based on the morphology alone, if we compare the decim versus the Cassini and Decula group, we do see a significant difference in conidial length and width. I'm just showing conidial length here, uh, but it is significant. So those patterns we saw play out in the 28S data um, are, are supported independently by morphology data. We also generated an ITS tree, and this is a you know, uh, kind of a, a rough draft tree, but you can clearly see um, those clades kind of resolve out uh, with high bootstrap support. So there's definitely two genealogically distinct clades, but it's unclear if they represent novel species or if just uh, basically two independent clades within a single species concept. Um, what's really interesting is that the clades one and two we're seeing here parallel uh, the the early host split between septum decim, tray decim group, and the recent ancestor of the Cassini decula group, as seen here. Um, there are some challenges to aligning ITS. That's why you don't see all the mesospora species represented here. Um, and there's many introns, many of which are above 100 base pairs. So it's technically, technically difficult to align these things, even with alignment software. Since 2016, we went from zero DNA sequences to a dozens uh, or dozens deposited in GenBank. We have the first phylogeny and taxonomic revision of mesospora, the discovery of cathinone production and amphetamine in mesospora cicadina infected individuals. We have the first draft genome resulting in the large genome to date, unprecedented ITS2 linked polymorphisms spanning some 2,000 base pairs, and the first evidence of parallel cladogenesis between mesospora and their cicada hosts, which spans some 100 million years of evolutionary time. Um, if we learned, uh, if what we learned about mesospora cicadina holds true, we may even find larger genomes associated with mesospora levispora and mesospora tetagotis uh, based on some, some preliminary data, um, upwards of two to 2.5 billion base pairs. Um, and, and likely these interactions between mesospora and uh, their cicada hosts probably result in novel small molecule production, not unlike the cathinone and psilocybin we found in two of the species that we've characterized. With that, um, I'll say thank you uh, to the Linnaean Society of London for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, I'll take any questions you have. Thanks so much.